Hello, my name is Cameron Berin, and today I'm going to talk about the dynamic visual acuity test and its role in assessing vestibular compensation. Today's agenda includes a brief review of pathophysiology of dynamic visual acuity. Then we'll talk about different types of the DVA test. One, non-instrumented or bedside DVA testing, and the other, computerized DVA testing. A review of the advantages and disadvantages of the two methods will be presented. Then we'll talk about performing and interpreting the DVA test. We'll also describe the relationship of the DVA findings with the level of compensation. Next, there will be a discussion of the gaze stabilization test, which is often used as a variation of the DVA testing. Finally, we'll discuss the clinical value of the DVA. Patients with vestibular abnormalities often complain of loss of visual acuity during head movements. This symptom is caused by the dysfunction of the vestibular ocular reflex, or VOR. In these patients, the VOR is no longer able to generate fully compensatory eye movements, which results in the slippage of the image and loss of visual acuity during head movements. Visual acuity during head movements improve with vestibular compensation. So the aim of DVA testing is to compare visual acuity for when the head is still with the visual acuity for when the head is moving. The test can be then used to evaluate the level of vestibular compensation. The vestibular system essentially behaves as a three-dimensional scale. The changes in the balance between two sides tell us about the direction and amplitude of head movements. For simplicity, only the head movements in the plane of the lateral semicircular canals will be considered here. When the head is at rest, the tonic neural activity from the right and left sides are equal. This is depicted as the sides of the scales being in equilibrium. When the head moves to one direction, neural activities from that side increase, and at the same time, neural activities from the opposite side decrease. The faster the head moves, the bigger the difference in neural firings from different sides becomes. The information about head movements is sent to the eye muscles to the vestibular and oculomotor nuclei. This information is used by the VOR to move the eyes with the same velocity as the head, but in the opposite direction. If we look at the head and eye velocities, they're essentially equal, but in opposite directions. As a result, the retinal slip will be minimized, which is necessary to have a clear vision during head movements. Retinal slip represents the position and movement of the eyes in space. Immediately after a unilateral vestibular loss, the neural firings from the damaged side decrease. The patient perceives the head moving toward the intact side and experiences vertigo and nausea. This is manifested as spontaneous nystagmus with fast phases beating away from the side of lesion. DVA testing is not particularly helpful for patients in this stage of lesion. Over the course of several days, to the process of vestibular compensation, the tonic neural firing is restored to the damaged side, and the patient's symptoms and spontaneous nystagmus disappear, as long as the head remains still. This is a milestone in the recovery of the patient, and it represents static compensation. In patients with a unilateral loss of vestibular function, when the head moves as before, neural firings change only half as much 
and as a result, head movements are underestimated. That means the eye velocity is also half as large as the head velocity. Because the eye movements are not fully compensatory, the eyes do not remain stationary in space during head movements. Here you see the mismatch between head and eye velocities, which causes retinal slip. As a result, the images do not stay stationary on the retina and become blurry during head movements. In other words, dynamic visual acuity deteriorates because of retinal slip. The amplitude of retinal slip can be reduced if the brain learns the new pattern of neural firing and moves the eyes faster in response to head movements. This is the next milestone in recovery and it represents dynamic compensation. It is not known if dynamic compensation can fully restore visual acuity or just improve it. The rehab specialists use head-eye coordination exercises such as X1, X2 exercises, which are intended to promote dynamic compensation through adaptation and central reprogramming of vestibular pathways. Let me take a quick detour and briefly explain what X1, X2 exercises are for those of you who may not be familiar with them. They're basically gaze stabilization exercises that can improve coordination of head and eye movements. The therapist usually sends the patient home with a description of what he or she is supposed to do. The patient is instructed to focus on a target, such as a business card with writings on it, and to hold this card at arm's length. The patient is supposed to start moving the head side to side slowly, and then increase the velocity to the point where the writing starts to get blurry. The patient is instructed to stay around the same velocity for several seconds, and the exercise should be repeated a few times. The aim is that the head velocity, where things become blurry, increases over time, and the patient's dynamic visual acuity improves. In the X1 part of the exercise, the target or the business car business card is stationary and can be held in hand or affixed to the wall. In the X2 exercises, the patient usually holds the card at arm's length and moves it either in the same direction with the head or in the opposite direction. The head movements are usually prescribed for both horizontal and vertical planes. In rare occasions, movements in the roll plane are also included. For higher head velocities, the mismatch between the head and eye velocities is worse when the head moves toward the side of lesion. The reason is that when neural firings reach zero, they cannot decrease no matter how much the head velocity increases. That means dynamic visual acuity is more severely affected when the head moves toward the side of lesion. This slide shows the difference in retinal slip for head movements toward and away from the side of lesion. For half of the sinusoid, where the head is moving toward the side of lesion, the retinal slip is larger compared to the other half. In patients who suffer from severe bilateral vestibular lesions, the VOR function is mostly impaired. In these patients, head movements cause large retinal slips and result in severe deterioration of visual acuity. Interestingly, therapists often use the same X1, X2 head-eye coordination exercises, but instead of adaptation of vestibular pathways, the aim is to promote substitution of vestibular sensors with oculomotor and neck receptors. 
This brings us to the dynamic visual acuity or DVA test. Traditional vestibular tests such as the caloric test, VHIT, and VEMPS are intended to identify presence of pathology. They're considered diagnostic site of lesion tests. That's useful because the test results remain essentially the same as long as the pathology is stable. But they do not give any indication of the level of patient compensation. DVA is one of the few tests where the test results can change with the level of compensation. And in fact, it may be the only test that examines the VOR compensation. DVA can document impairment, and that's very important to differentiate that from pathology. In other words, patients with the same pathology can have low or high impairment based on the level of compensation. This makes DVA a good tool to assess the effectiveness of rehabilitation and exercise-based therapies. The early versions of DVA relied on the testing that did not involve any instrumentation. In the non-instrumented or bedside DVA, the patient is seated at the given distance from an eye chart. The examiner asks the patient to read the lowest line without moving the head. This provides the baseline visual acuity. This is sometimes called the static visual acuity, which is fine, but can confuse the patient because they expect, they expect this value to match what they get in the standard eye exam for an optometrist or ophthalmologist. It often does not, and that's why baseline visual acuity is probably a more appropriate terminology here. The next step is to ask the patient to read the lowest recognizable line during head movements. This determines the dynamic visual acuity. In normal individuals, visual acuity decreases by fewer than two lines during head movements. After an acute vestibular loss, visual acuity deteriorates significantly during head movements sometimes by as much as six lines or more. But the performance improves over time due to dynamic compensation. As you saw before, dynamic compensation reduces retinal slip and improves dynamic visual acuity. Head movements can be performed actively, meaning by the patient, or passively, meaning by the clinician. There's a difference of opinion if the two methods produce different results, and if so, which one is better? Passive testing seems to produce more repeatable results, but as long as one method is used consistently, the results can be compared over time and interpreted effectively. The prescribed head rotations in the bedside DVA are sinusoidal with the frequency of about two hertz, or two cycles per second. That means the head moves from one side to the other side and back to the starting point in half a second. Usually a metronome is used to synchronize the head movements. The problem is that the input to the vestibular system is the head velocity and not the frequency. So the peak velocity can vary significantly depending on the amplitude of head movements. For example, if I move my head at plus minus 10 degrees, the peak velocity is about 125 degrees per second. If I move my head at plus minus 30 degrees, the peak velocity is closer to 375 degrees per second. In the DVA testing, the head movement can be performed in the horizontal or yaw plane, the vertical or pitch plane, and in the roll plane. There are a few limitations associated with the bedside DVA test. One of the major limitations is that the letters are visible during the entire head movement. 
because the head velocity varies throughout the head rotation, the patient can try to read the letters during the slow parts of the head movement. The other limitation is that the bedside test does not differentiate between the visual acuity for movements toward or away from the side of lesion. As you saw before, there's a difference in the dynamic visual acuity for the two sides in patients with the unilateral vestibular loss. In the computerized DVA test, the patient is seated at the prescribed distance from a computer screen. The patient wears an inertial measurement unit, or IMU, that can measure the head movements in three dimensions. The older IMUs were wired, but the new versions are wireless, which is preferable because it doesn't restrict head movements. In place of the eye chart, the computer displays images that the patient needs to identify. The images can be letters, words, or most commonly optotypes. Typical optotypes include tumbling E's or Landolt C's. The patient is asked to identify the direction of the optotype, such as up, down, right, or left. Here you see the video of a different version of DVA that uses a larger screen. This particular test is for vertical head movements. In the next video, you see the progression of the test as the patient identifies the optotype direction and inputs that to the computer. The process of inputting the data can be done by the patient or by the clinician. You first saw the baseline visual acuity test, and now the patient is uh, doing the same during the head movements. And here's another for the left side with the target velocity of 100 degrees per second. After completing the horizontal test, now the dynamic visual acuity is tested for the vertical direction. Before determining the dynamic visual acuity, the computerized system first determines two parameters. The first parameter, as we discussed, is the baseline visual acuity, which is the visual acuity with the head at rest. The second parameter is called by different names. Let's call it the visual processing time here. It refers to the minimum time that's required to display the letter or the optotype before visual perception fails and the patient is unable to see the image. Remember, one of the limitations of the bedside test was that the letters were displayed the whole time. The goal in the computerized system it is to display the image long enough for the patient to see it, but short enough so that the head velocity remains relatively constant during the letter display. We can do that by knowing the visual processing time. Patients with excessively long visual processing time cannot be tested accurately. These types of excessively long visual processing time can be associated with central processing abnormalities. For example, you can see that in patients after a concussion. For dynamic visual acuity, the computerized system keeps track of the head velocity and displays the optotype only when the velocity is within the prescribed range. As we talked about the bedside testing, the head movements can be performed actively or passively. The most common head velocity profile is sinusoidal within the range of 80 to 120 degrees per second for horizontal or yaw movements. 
Some articles and commercial devices use other velocity profiles. For example, you may be familiar with the functional head impulse test, or F-HIT. F-HIT is actually not a head impulse test. It is a DVA test that measures visual acuity during impulsive head movements. During the test, the patient is asked to identify the direction or orientation of the optotype. Very similar to what one goes through during an eye exam, the computer reduces or enlarges the size of the optotype based on if the patient correctly identifies the direction in the previous trial. A threshold search algorithm determines the limit of visual acuity based on the entire profile of correct and incorrect answers. This slide shows a typical presentation of the DVA results. On the right-hand side, you see a table that lists what size optotype was displayed and if the patient identified its direction correctly. There are two tables, one for head movements in one direction, in this case, leftward DVA, and one for the opposite direction, in this case, rightward DVA. The graph at the top shows the progression of the test from the beginning to the point where the computer is able to determine the threshold. It looks like the test took longer for the leftward DVA. This happens if the patient can see the optotype, can recognize the direction, but somehow because of lack of attention might call out the wrong direction, or if the wrong direction button is pushed on the remote. That seems to be the case in this trial, in this uh, test, with the third trial being where the wrong answer was provided. Good threshold search algorithms can recover from such a mistake as long as there are not too many of them. On the left-hand side at the top, you see the summary of the test results and the acuity level for each direction. The results are also shown in the bar graph form below. This particular system also provides a consistency index that tells the user how reliable the estimated threshold is. For example, the, consistent, the consistency index is slightly lower for the leftward DVA in this case because of the mistake that was uh, encountered in one of the trials. Below the graphs, you also see more summary, which shows the results both in a logmar form and also in a 2020 format. It also displays the average head velocity during the testing for each direction and how many lines of acuity was lost. This is a different DVA system. In this case, thresholds are displayed for different head velocities in different directions, with the baseline visual acuity displayed for zero head velocity. The top figure is for horizontal or yaw head movements, and the bottom one is for vertical or pitch head movements. Here are the results from a patient who has a right vestibular lesion. The middle bar in the bar graph shows the baseline threshold, and the thin blue line represents two lines above the baseline threshold. As you can see, the patient's leftward DVA is considerably better than her rightward DVA. For the rightward DVA, the loss of acuity is approximately three lines. This slide shows the DVA results for a patient over the course of rehab therapy. Before rehab, the leftward DVA is significantly worse, but it improves over time and with therapy. This is really the most important feature of DVA because it tells you the level of impairment independent of the level of lesion. When you combine it with something like the V-HIT, you can get both the presence of a lesion and also the level of compensation. 
There's a companion test called the gauge stabilization test, which some systems provide. GST is often performed with or in place of the DVA test. GST determines the head velocity that causes significant deterioration of visual acuity. The main difference is that in GST, the letter size is kept the same and it's the head velocity that's changed. The head velocity can range from as low as 30 degrees per second to as high as 300 degrees per second. The benefit of GST is that it can compare an individual's performance with expected demands of daily activities. For example, patients whose GST results are lower than 80 to 85 degrees per second, these patients should be advised that they are at risk of falling. Alternatively, GST can be used for individuals who are involved in higher demand activities, such as in sports or certain occupations. Another benefit is that the therapist can prescribe head-eye coordination exercises most appropriate for the patient. For example, in a patient with a GST of 120 degrees per second, you want to start the head-eye coordination exercises right around or slightly below that value and push that up as the patient makes progress. Here are the results for a normal individual during a standard performance GST. In the standard performance test, the maximum velocity is limited to 150 degrees per second. A person who can achieve that level of GST can perform their normal daily activities with no issues. So from a clinical point of view, there's no need to proceed beyond that level. One of my colleagues, Shelley Massingill at the Banner Concussion Center, prefers GST over DVA because she says if the person's GST is higher than 100 degrees per second, by definition, he or she should have a normal DVA. So she can skip the DVA test, but she will still have a very good idea of where she needs to start her therapy sessions and at what head velocities. The display for the GST is very similar to the DVA. The only exception is that in the graph and in the tables, instead of the optotype size, you see the head velocities. In fact, you see two different head velocities. Target head velocity, this is the velocity that's set by the computer, and it's the desired head velocity. And the other column, you see achieved head velocity. This is the actual head velocity that the patient achieves during each trial. By relying on the achieved head velocity for the analysis, it's likely that the results will be more accurate. Here are the results for high-performance GST, where the head velocities can go up to 300 degrees per second. This test is appropriate for athletes and high-performing individuals. For example, this can be a very useful test for an athlete who might suffer a concussion. This athlete might perform at a normal level when compared for typical individuals. But if you compare his or her own performance to the performance before concussion, there might be a significant deterioration. So this kind of testing can provide um, a good uh, quantitative method for determining when it's appropriate for the patient to resume play and go back to their activities. An interesting side note here, in testing the baseball players of a major league team, even 300 degrees per second was not enough because the players were consistently achieving that level. So we had to temporarily increase the maximum head velocity to 400 degrees per second so we can get a good baseline on these uh, um, baseball players. Here are the GST results for a patient with the right-sided lesion. As you can see, the GST velocity threshold is much lower at 75 degrees per second for rightward head movements 
compared to GST of greater than 150 degrees per second for leftward head movements. Uh, this will indicate, um, suggest that the patient will have an abnormal DVA for rightward head movement, which in this case he did. This also gives the therapist a good starting point uh, at 75 or slightly below to start the head-eye coordination exercises. So to summarize, the computerized DVA test and GST provide objective tools for assessing the VOR function in different planes. Unlike the diagnostic tests of vestibular function, the DVA test can document the impairment and the level of vestibular compensation. The results of DVA and GST can be used to optimize the therapy protocol. For example, head-eye coordination exercises can be designed to gradually increase the GST threshold. The user can select the direction and head velocities that allow for targeted training. Thank you very much for your attention.